little bit this morning, if you don't mind. We're just going to sing a couple songs and we're going to get into a little something different this morning. Let's pray before we get started. God, we love you. And we come into this place this morning because of who you are. And so, God, we worship you this morning, whether it's in a warehouse in the middle of Alabama or wherever it is, God, we worship you because you're here. And so, God, we're, we're two or more gathered. That's where you are. So you're here this morning. So would you move in our lives? We don't just want to come into this place and check a box or, or have a performance, God. We want to we want to meet you. And God, we just want to encounter the almighty God. We just want you to change us this morning. So we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. See you. 
Father, we just come into this place this morning and we just want to give you praise. You are worthy of all of our worship. God, if you never do another thing for us, God, you're so worthy. So we just worship you this morning because of who you are, not just what you've done for us, God. You've done so much for who you are. So we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Y'all grab the chairs. We're going to do things a little different. God put on my heart this word, and honestly, the opportunity is going to be to practice what we're going to hear immediately. So uh, this morning, we're going to talk about worship and what worship means. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to be real with you guys. If you don't know me, that's how I am. And so, you know, don't take offense. I'm just going to speak boldly and, and clearly to you. And so uh, I just want to be honest because I, I've, I've got a little bit of experience in this area. I've done worship a long time, and so uh, it's, it's been a minute. My daughters are both in it, and so uh, I just want to come and bring a word and let you know what it means because I think it's hard for people to say, well, I'm stepping into worship, I don't know what it means. And I'll be honest, like I, it, it's weird for me growing up. You know, I wasn't in church until I was about almost eight years old, and so we started fresh, and uh, it's funny because I tell people I didn't grow up in church. So, like I started when I was eight years old, they're like, you grew up in church. So maybe I did, but it was just, I, I still remember the times it didn't. But I remember going to church, and back then, when you, when you went to church, you went at 9.45, you went to Sunday school, and you got an envelope, and it had all these things on it. It's like, did you bring your Bible? Did you bring an offering? You know, did you bring a friend? Whatever. And you check these boxes, and then at 11 o'clock, we had what we call worship. And it was on a bulletin. You had this little piece of paper, and it says, worship. And, you, you know, starting at 11, and the Baptist church, we ended at noon. Like, if you ended at 12.01... People were, were really mad. Okay, you don't you don't end at twelve oh one. It's time to go eat, and so that's what we got to do. So worship was this. It was just where we went in the sanctuary, and that was it. Like we're in the sanctuary, you got worship. And, and then I remember, you know, we had the choir. My parents were in the choir, and you know they'd have the choir robes on. And of course, I'm sitting out there by myself, and I'd be acting the fool sometimes. And all of a sudden, I just you know you feel like the, the death stare. And I'd look up, my mom would just be like, she'd be singing, she'd be like this. And she'd have the hymnal, she'd be like, hallelujah. And I was just feeling it. I was like, oh, Lord, I got, I got to straighten up. Like, here we go. Like, all right, mama, mama sees me, let's go. But then I became right about preteen, and, and something crazy happened in the Baptist church. Uh, we started doing, like, praise songs. And, I mean, like, old school praise songs that we thought were awesome, right? You know, they were new to us. And every Sunday night, we would we would do something crazy. At the end of the service, we would sing a praise song. We might sing like, as the deer, or the water, whatever, you know. Or I love you, Lord. And anyhow, what would happen at the end, he would say, hey, listen, what we're going to do. We're all going to stand up. We're going to cross the aisles. And we're going to hold hands with a person. And we're going to worship together. And that's the first time I really remember hearing the word worship. Yeah, we're going to worship together. And, and we were going to sing. And of course, as a, as a preteen, man, I was, I was a lot smarter than I looked. And so I got the idea that, you know, 
I could sit on an aisle across from a pretty girl. Oh, come on. So I don't sit next to her. I just sit across the aisle from her. And when that moment comes to stand up and hold hands, I'm like, who knew? Like this, uh, what, this has got to be God's sent right here. Just letting you know, you know, I feel the presence of the Spirit. Whatever. But, but we would hold hands. And then every once in a while, I remember we would see this crazy, charis- what we call charismatic person in our church that would that would literally just do this number. <coughs> what? And they go, they would go, they would go pistol, pistol up. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. They're trying to shoot the Lord. I don't know what's going on. But okay, like that's it right here. Like we got, we got, a, we got a pistol going up in the air. And and it's the first experience I ever had of something like that. Like it was, it was crazy. And you say, man, that doesn't make any sense. And, and so I, I ended up spending years of just studying what God wants on worship. And what I've, what I've determined and what I've found through his word is that it doesn't look like what we think it looks like. Um, I was talking to my brother here this morning. I mean, and it, we're going to talk about this. Worship is not just something you sing. It's not just an instrument you play. It is how you live your life. Now, we come into this place called corporate worship, and that's what we do when we gather together in here. There is a corporate unity together. We're going to talk about that, what it means. But what I want to tell you this morning is that we're going to talk about it and how God defined it. First off, there's three angels that are actually mentioned by name in Scripture. Okay? The first one is Michael. So you hear about Michael mainly. You'll hear all over the place, but he's really big in Daniel. If you go read the book of Daniel, you're going to hear Michael. Daniel starts praying. If you don't know what's going on, Daniel spends 21 days of fasting and praying. And he gets down. I mean, he's praying hard. He's praying for this. And he, he gets a little discouraged. He's like, I don't know you know, what's going on. My prayers haven't been answered. And Michael comes to him and the angel says, dude, the moment you started praying, all hell broke out. And we have been fighting against the forces of evil literally every day since you started praying. Out. That's a battle. And so Michael, it, it actually means like God, and his angel basically that represents prayer. Anytime you see Michael, you're talking about prayer. You're talking about representing that, okay? But you have another uh, angel in the Bible named Gabriel, which we might be familiar with. He comes to the Virgin Mary, right? That's his, his famous story. He comes there, and he's going to tell her you're going to conceive and give birth to uh, the Messiah. And so Gabriel, anytime you listen to him in the Word, he's act, he's actually, his name actually means man of God. Uh, there'll be times in Scripture you'll say, I talk to the man of God. And that's what is referring back to Gabriel. But Gabriel, me and that angel, actually represents the Word of God. So every time Gabriel comes, you're talking about the Word. So Michael's got prayer. Gabriel's got the Word. And then there was one other angel mentioned by name in Scripture. And that angel's name is Lucifer. Lucifer was created... Honestly, in a perfect sense, to be all worship for God. His whole creation, and you're, we're going to read about it in just a minute, but Lucifer literally means light bearer, right? And so he actually represents, you're going to see in Ezekiel, I'm going to read this to you in Ezekiel 28. It says, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned adorned you. He lists them out. I don't know what they are. But then he says your settings, which actually the word means timbrels, and your mountings, which are flutes, were made of gold. So basically, he's an angel, which sounds crazy to me. I don't understand how it looks, but his body is actually made of musical instruments. Like, his body is a flute. His body is the woodwind. His body is the percussion. He was created as an instrument of worship to God. And so I want to read what happens in Isaiah. Because what happened is, if you don't know the story of Lucifer, and, and I, I have different thoughts on it, um, we're going to talk about it. But listen to what happened in Isaiah. He was created for worship. Let's remember that. And listen to what Isaiah says in 14, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once lay low the mountains or the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephyr. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. All right, so I want to say this before we go any further. So God created you for worship. We're going to talk about that. But here's the issue. You've got to be careful about our pride. 
All right? And so when we worship God, and we're going to talk about it more and more, but when we come into this place, even this warehouse, and when we get here at 6 a.m., and we invite the Holy Spirit of the living God into this place, there needs to be an awe and a respect that takes place. And you go, man, I don't want to be here. Great. doesn't matter. I don't like worship. Good. It's not for you anyway. But when you're in here and you're together, I'm, just, I'm, I'm giving you fair warning from Scripture that we have to be careful when we come together as a corporate body and we invite the presence of the Holy God in this place and we do not respect Him. There's not a fear as in you should tremble before Him like I'm afraid of something. No, it's a, it's a respect and awe of a living God. And so what I'm saying is you're going to hear different ways of worship. We're going to talk about it. But this is what happened. My man was created for worship. That's what he was there for. His body was an instrument. And yet he gets prideful. He wants to take over the spot of God. He wants to be the one. Hey, wait a second. We're worshiping God, and I'm the one making all this noise. I'm the one doing this. There's pride that comes in, all right? So we got to make sure we're, we're careful of that. But listen to what happens. I love this. Jesus actually mentions it. Right, and so obviously we think, you know, the word of God, Jesus is the word, and so all of it, we can understand that. But when Jesus was on the earth, when he spoke specific things as a man, I mean, we take, we really take notice of those things. And he talked about it. He talked about Satan. He talked about Lucifer in, in Luke 10. And he gives a, a very cool verse to me. Because he, he doesn't give him much time. He just says it really in passing. He's like, hey, I was there. I was there when the fight broke out in heaven. And he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And, and the guys that have been around me maybe heard this already, but I, for those that haven't, like, this was not like a, a, a fight like Rocky. If you ever seen the old Rocky movies, you know, where I don't know how my man's alive at the end, like it's a boom, you know, hitting each other. I mean, they're just boom, you know, oh, they're, they're going 15 rounds, and, and you know, it's back and forth, and, and it's, it's an edged out Rocky win at the end. That's not how this happened. See, God is not here, and Satan is not here. It's God is way up there, and Satan is, is way down here. There, there is no rival. There, there's no equal. Okay? It'd be like the University of Alabama coming and play at Smith Station High School. Okay? And if you, you thought, well, Smith Station High School's got a shot. Well, we, we need to drug test you again. There's something going on. Because that ain't true. They, they don't step on the field and you're like, well, man, they can't. no, it's not going to happen. Okay, it's just not going to happen. And, and that, that didn't even come close to comparing God versus Satan. So I want you to understand we don't need to put them on the same level. Amen. Jesus made it clear. I saw that man fall like lightning. But how's lightning? Bam, done. Okay, so it was I stepped up against God and it was done. So I say all that because I want to make sure we're clear before we go any further. Satan was created as the worship leader, as the worshiper. And upon his fall, what happens is now God has, has put that task on us. Uh, I believe in all my heart that we were created. The reason we were created. And the reason you have purpose, your purpose in life, is to glorify God Amen. in everything you do. So you say, I'm wondering, what am I created for? What am I here for? What's my purpose? Your purpose is to glorify God in all you do. Well, I can't sing. It's not about that. We're going to talk about it. It's about offering everything I have to God. Uh, if I'm working out, that's going, all right, when I don't feel it, I'm giving it to you, God. When I'm working out in the field, when I'm working hard, when I'm not getting seen by my boss like I think I should, no, I'm going to offer myself and I'm going to do it as I'm, as I'm doing it unto the Lord. That's worship. And so we are the new worship leaders. You are. It's not my words, it's his, okay? And so it says that in Psalm 29 too. He says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. That's not a, a, a suggestion. It's a command. All right, we are here to worship. Matter of fact, if y'all know the story of Jesus met a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman at the well, which he breaks all the rules by talking to her and all those things. But aside from that, I think it's very interesting. Once he tells her her history, he tells her, oh, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're with now is not your husband. She's like, man, you must be a prophet. And the first thing she says after that, I think it's interesting. She says, she asked him about worship immediately. She's like, wait a second, you Jews say you have to worship here, but we say we have to worship here. What's the truth? 
So the first thing she asks Jesus when she thinks he's somebody of importance is about worship. I think that's interesting. And Jesus makes a statement to her that he'll neither worship on this mountain or that mountain. The true <laughs> worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. So what does that mean? That means in everything that we have. That means in our truth, where, where no one's looking, where we're by ourselves, or where we're in a corporate place, it's worship. And so what is worship? There's a definition for it. And the <coughs> definition is it's a feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for something of value. That's just a lot of stuff. But I will tell you right now, it's just basically what do you hold the highest esteem? What do you... What sits, as I like to say, on the throne of your heart? What do you give? You want to know? Here's three easy ways to figure out. Where's your time go? Where's your talent go? Where's your treasure go? Because there, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And so where you're spending all your time doing and what, where you're spending all your talent that God, that God gave you, what are you doing with that? How are you using that? And so those are the ways you can use that. We're going to talk about it. All right? But again, this is not a suggestion. Now, and breaking this down, I'm going to give you a little bit of history so y'all just know. Bear with me. Try to wake up. Everybody say, I'm awake. I'm awake. All right. All right. I'm going to give you. There are seven words. If you don't understand, in the Bible, it's not written in English. It was not written in the King's English. King James Version, great for those who want to read that. That's not how Jesus taught. He didn't go around saying, thy, thou, whatever, okay? It was the Old Testament basically was written in Hebrew, um, a little bit of Aramaic, but the New Testament was in Greek. And so we want to study something. If you really want to look at things, you have to kind of go deep, all right? And so I like to take it, and I like to break down the word. The crazy thing is, throughout Scripture, for Hebrew, that we'll see the word praise or worship used throughout. The problem is that word has seven different meanings. There's actually seven different words. So I'm going to give them to you real quick. There's seven different words. I'm going to tell you what they mean. All right, so here we go. Stay with me. I'm going to try to pronounce these words. Halal, H-A-L-A-L. It's the primary word for praise. Okay, this is where hallelujah comes from. It's actually to be clamorously foolish. Full body expression of joy. That's what that word means. So we're talking about praise and halal. We're talking about, man, hallelujah to where I don't care about anything else. Matter of fact, this is used when King David's coming back. He goes to get the Ark of the Covenant. He's bringing it back in. And it says he's so... So amazed that God's alive. But every six steps, he, he offers an offering and he worships. But he comes back in, and he's the king. And he's got all these robes, he's got all this fancy. And he's walking in, coming into town. And they said he's dancing, he's ripping his robes. Apparently, things are coming out that shouldn't be coming out. There's all kind of stuff being seen. And his wife sees him, and she despises him. And she says, you are the king. You should, you should act in a better manner. And he says, woman, I'll become even more undignified than this. Amen. What you don't understand is what God has done for me, I can't stop. Come on, and so here's the truth about worship. It's not just an expression of something you value. I believe you cannot worship a living God unless you know him. And so I'm just being honest with you. So if you're like, man, I'm in this place and I'm having trouble, my question is, do you know him? Because, see, if you knew him and you know who I was and you knew what he pulled me out of, and you knew who he set me up to be, you would understand that when I sing about the goodness of God and how faithful he is, I can't help but get excited. It doesn't matter if the key's wrong. It doesn't matter how it sounds. This is who it is. I'm not worried about that. I'm focused on him. And that's what we have to do. And the law is that. It's simply saying, man, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be foolish to the point. I don't care what people think. All right? And I know there's some stuff, and it can be some distraction. And my dad used to always say, we don't want to be a distraction, right? God's got it order. I get that. And, and there's all that stuff. But at the same time, you've got, to, you've got to get to a place, even in a corporate setting, where it's you and God. That's what it should be. Not, not be distracted in that place. In that place, I'm focused on him. All right? The next word is tequila. Now, I didn't say tequila. <laughs> some of y'all are like, I can praise for that. Now, you give me some of that, I can worship. No, no, it's not tequila, it's tequila. All right? And that is a hymn. So it's where we get the songs from. It's actually a new song. It's a song, it's a new song, a spontaneous song. Basically meaning, if you get alone by yourself and you just start going, uh, you know, y'all ever seen the movie Elf? At a store and I'm singing. <laughs> right? It, I just, I can't help but picture that. Like, God just wants to hear what's on your heart. And so, and this is going to be weird. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to challenge you. Because y'all are like, man, I'm in. I'm not doing this. When you get alone, 
just start singing God's song. You're like, yeah, that's crazy and stuff. It is. But here's the thing. He doesn't He doesn't care how bad you sound. He doesn't care. He, he just, it's what's in your heart that's just going to start coming out. And if you're not sure what to do, just start singing hallelujah. You can't go wrong with hallelujah. Sing the name of Jesus. You can't go wrong with that. But just give it to him. But when we sing these songs, that's what this word is. It's, a, it's an act of praise. It's actually... Uh, Psalm 22, 3 says, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And it used the words of healing. The next is Tauda. T-A-W-D-A-H. It's an extension of the hand. Toda. Toda. Like, Toda. There you go. Toda. All right. It's an extension of the hand. Not this way. More this way. It's more thanksgiving for the things that have not been received yet. Did y'all hear that? I'm going to extend my hands this way. And I'm thanking God for the things I haven't even gotten yet. Yes. So some of you are like, man, I'm here, Kev. And man, I, I need to be there. We'll start thanking God for there. Well, yeah, but, but man, I got things going on that's pretty bad. And I really, I need a better job. Start, start thanking God for what's to come. Stop focusing on where you are. Ta-da! Ta-da! Yeah, right. hey, ta-da! I love that. I like it. I like it better. Ta-da! Ta-da! And he uses it in Psalms 56, 10. He says, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. He's talking about the praise on the word that's to come. And so that's an awesome thing. The next is Zamar. It means to make music. All right? So here you go. You say, well, I don't, I'm not a music guy. I can't worship. There's only one word that talks about making music. So if that's how you're gifted, great, man. My man can play. That's great. And that's a form of expression. There's times I just get along in my room and I just play. Honestly, the only reason I started playing keyboard was I begged God. I was like, can I just sit down and, and play just to you? Like, I didn't care if anybody ever heard it. I just want to be able to sit down and worship you one on one. And so that's the Mars, to make music. And here's the thing about music, scientifically proven, it actually penetrates the soul. It's crazy, okay? Those, those the sound waves get in deep. So you can have people that are like, man, I'm hardcore. I don't want to bring you on to nothing. And man, you start singing some songs, I don't like this. And all of a sudden, you're like, I don't know why I'm feeling something. It's because that's the sound waves are, are just penetrating. Matter of fact, they, they've recorded, they've got recordings from, if you haven't seen Deep Space, and they've got this stuff coming back, and it's literally these sound waves. And, and there's recordings of of all of nature. And when you break it down, it just sings this perfect harmony song. Like everything, see, Jesus says that, by the way. He's coming in Jerusalem, and all the people are like, hey, you need to tell your disciples to shut up. And he says, man, if I tell them to shut up, the rocks are going to cry out. Everything is created to worship, not just you. The rocks are crying out. You know, I love if I go in my room and start playing piano, my dog will get down off the couch, come in my room, and lay right at my feet every time. And all I think is like, and her name is Bama. Who doesn't know? My son, my son is a roll. My son named her Alabama Roll Tide Messer. That's her name because his mother is a Georgia Bulldog, and he wants her to say Roll Tide. Hasn't happened yet. But anyhow, Bama will come and lay at my feet. Every, I'm not talking about every time. And y'all like, yeah, she's a dog. No, no, she doesn't follow me. Like she stays on the couch. Like that's her spot. But every time I start, she's gonna come, and I can't help but think she's worship. Like she knows what's up. She's drawn to a holy God. There you go. So it's worship next. It actually says in Psalm 71, 22, I will praise you with the heart for your faithfulness. My God, I will sing praise you with the lyre. I will, the Holy One of Israel. So it talks about, that's the word it uses, Zamar. The next is Barak. Okay, not Obama, just Barak. But Barak is to kneel. There's a part where God is actually saying in worship, you're like, man, I don't know what that means. I, I can't sing. I can't lift my hands right now. Maybe you just need to kneel. Maybe you just need to fall down before an almighty God and say, here I am. Right? It's an act of surrender as well. But the rock to kneel is to bless God as an act of adoration. It's to salute him, to bow down to him, to thank him. We, we didn't grow up in a nation with kings. I get that. We don't understand the, the, the respect and awe that comes with a king that walks in and you bow down. You don't look him in the eye because he has so much power. I get that. But that's what it's referring to here. Two more, and we're going to get into some scripture a little bit extra. Shabbat. This is to address in a loud tone. This is a shout. Everybody give me a shout. One, two, three, shout. <laughs> Actually command in scripture. You're like, are you kidding me? Yeah. There's a time you just got to shout. 
I'll tell you something else. That's right. We, we know about this. When they marched around Jericho seven times and blew a horn, and all of a sudden they gave a shout. It was a praise. It was Shabbat. They didn't just shout. They shouted with everything they had for a living God. And man, the walls came falling down. Also in Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all you nations, and sold him, all you peoples. It's praise and shout to the Lord. It's a song. There's somebody should write that for you. Shout to the Lord. Address the loud song. The last one that we're going to focus on a little bit more today is going to be the word yada. Yada, yada, yada. Right? I like that word, yada. Yada is to revere and worship with extended hands. Now, it's not here. It's here. So you're like, man, I don't want to raise my hands. Raise my hands is stupid. Fine, don't raise your hands. I'm not gonna. We're not gonna be a you know a dictator up here and say raise your hands. I, I don't want to. I don't want to dictate you how to worship. I want you to worship God the way He draws you. And it's a process. It's learning that. What I, what I will say is don't don't stand here and worship and talk to the guy next to you while we're worshiping. You know, don't do that. If you don't want to do anything, but stand there, stand there. Because I do believe God is is moving in your heart whether you know it or not. And he'll get to you. But yada is this expression of hands raised, palms open. You might know what this position looks like. Yeah. Breathe. Some of you might have seen that, right? Breathe. Hey. But it is. Why? Why do I do this? Why why is an officer to say do this? Hey, I want to see you got nothing in your hands. You got nothing you can use. You're you're hey I, I'm completely totally surrendered. This is an act of praise, and we're going to talk about it real quick. I want to read you one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. And if you know me, every, pretty much every story I ever say, I'll probably say the same thing about that. But I love it. I love it. I love God's Word. I want to read this real quick. So we're going to do something different today. We're actually going to, I'm going to, yeah, real quick, real quick. I'm going to speak on this, and in the last couple minutes, we're actually going to, we're going to put this into practice. We're going to worship. And you're going to say, man, one of these things that, that hit me, I'm going to go back through it. But one of these things hit me, that's, that's what I'm going to do today. And I'm going to challenge you to step out of your comfort zone and actually let God have control of your life. And just watch what happens. All right? But I want to read a story out of Second Chronicles about a king named Jehoshaphat. Everybody say Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. I call him Fat Joe. All right? I call him Fat Joe. So Fat Joe, king of Judah, and he comes on the scene. And he gets immediately. He kind of he comes he comes in and makes a pact with this one of the worst kings ever, Ahab. Right? Ahab calls him in and says, "Look, man, I'm going to go to battle against these guys. Would you come with me?" He's like, "Hey, let's let's talk to the prophet of God first. Smart. Pray first. While I wear the black bracelet, pray first. Right? Hey, let's pray first. Good job, Fat Joe. So we want to do pray first. But the prophet says, "Don't do it." And Fat Joe's like, "Pray anyway." They go out there and get their butts up. Fat Joe's pulled back. Uh, Ahab, not so good. Doesn't work out for him. Fat Joe's still alive. So now he comes on. He's starting to change things. He's starting to try to get to the back to where they were. And this is what it says in 2 Chronicles. It says there's an army that is raised up. It was three different people. The Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Menuites. Okay? A lot of ites. But basically there was a vast army that, that rose up against Israel. And it says in verse 3 of chapter 20, Alarm, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Hey, same thing you did last time. Great. First off, if that's not what you're doing when you're in a situation, if you're not inquiring of the Lord, man, I'm telling you right now, that's the best thing to do. Pray first. Not after. Not once you're in it. Pray first. Ask God what he wants first. It'll make a big difference. But then he proclaims a fast and he does all this. But he stands up. He gets everybody together from Judah. I mean, everybody. Men, women, children, everybody. And this is what he prays. I want to focus on his prayer in, chat, in verse 6. It says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or judgment or pl plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from the three places whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when we came out of Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. 
See how they are repaying us now by coming to drive out the possession that you gave us as an inheritance. Oh God, will you not judge them? And then here's my here's here's the part we need to focus on. For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Man, what a powerful scripture. This is happening. And, and he's got word that there's not just one army coming against them, three. They're outmatched three to one. And he's thinking, we got to go fight these guys. And he gets up, and I love what he does. We're going to focus on some of the things he does because, you know, he, he doesn't just, just step up. He does three things that I think we need to look at. First thing he does is he remembers how big his God is. See, a lot of you are so focused on how big your problem is or whatever your life's going on. That's what your focus is on, and your focus on, well, what was me, what was me? No, your, your eyes need to get off of your problem. You need to get onto your God, who is so big and so great, who can do abundantly more than ever we can ever imagine or ask. Amen. You've got to get off the problem and start focusing on him. That's the first thing he does. He doesn't go to God first and go, oh, no, we're going to die. These armies are coming against us. We're going to die. You lied to us. That's not what he did. It's not in Scripture. The first thing he did is, God, we know who you are. I mean, you're the, you haven't changed. There's a rumor that God's not the same as he was. That's not what he says. He's been the, he's always the same. He's the same today as he always was. The same God that split the Red Sea and they walked across. The same God that rose Jesus from the dead. It's the same God. He hasn't changed. His power hasn't changed. Matter of fact, he's still seated. I love that about him. I love that about him. He doesn't get up and go, oh, man, I'm look. No, he's just like, he's sitting there. He's like, it's good. I know it's good. Yeah. But then he's good. Like, I'm, I'm all, you know, all nervous what's going on. He's just like, oh, good, it's good. It's good. Everything's good. Trust me, the earth is his footstool. Like, isn't that great? <laughs> I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So we got to first off, when you're going through something or wherever you're going, when you're talking about worship, when you get in today, when we go back up through the worship, here's what I want you to do. I want you to focus on who God is. That's it. Who is he? Man, if you start thinking, he created all of this. I'm mean, not talking about all this. Everything just works in harmony. I'm an engineer, so I, I, when I build things, and they don't, they, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever built anything or done anything that's worked the first time. Like, it's just trial and error. But yeah, God spoke it, and it works, and it still works exactly how it's supposed to. I mean, the earth is doing this while doing this around a big ball of just fire that is just close enough so we have the heat we need, and, and it's not too close to where it kills us. I mean, like, the atmosphere is made up of every. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable when you start thinking about it. I shouldn't use the word unbelievable. But sometimes I'm like, God, it's so hard to believe, I should probably say. It's hard to believe how awesome you are. And so if we will focus this morning, we come back up, just who God is. The next thing, what does he do? He, he, he remembers who, what God's promised. He, he tells God, like, you brought us out of this. You brought us into this land. If y'all don't know, they were coming. They were going to go through these lands. They actually asked. They said, hey, can we just walk through your territory? We won't do anything. We won't drink anything. We just want to get from here to there, and you're right in the middle. And these kingdoms, all of them went, no. Now, if you come up on us, we're going to fight you. We're going to kill you. And God takes them the long way. We talked about that last time I was here, the waiting. Of how God sometimes puts us in the waiting because he's trying to teach us something. He's trying to prepare us for what's to come. So what we have to do is we got to talk about who God is. We got to focus on who He is, and we got to remember what He's promised. What does He promise you? God? Oh my God, didn't promise me anything. Yes, He has. Yes, He has promised you something. He's promised all of us something. All right, that we are to be used for His glory. So whatever we do, whether we eat, drink, whatever we do, we're going to do it all for the glory of God. So His promise to you is that you are not going to have to be the same that you are now. Jesus has come to fulfill that promise and say, guess what? You are dead to that life. You are raised into a new life. That's the promise God has for you. You got to stop going, this is who I am. No, that's what you did. It's not who you are. Who does God say you are? And that's what you got to remember. God, I focus on this. Man, you are so amazing. But God, I also remember, when you, you pulled me up out of nothing. I mean, I was dead in my sin and you saved me and not only that you call me righteous you call me holy like you don't even see me as oh this is kevin who used to do that no 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 he sees me as holy 
Not because of anything I could ever do, but because of who he is. Remember that. You want to help get to a spot of worship? Remember what he's done for you. And here's the last thing he did. Here's where the word comes in, yada. He surrendered to God's will. Listen to what they do. Man. Tell me if this isn't like, I'm not, I'm not a military guy, but this is, a, this is definitely not my strategy I'm going to use. He actually says, uh, they, they, God, God ignites this guy just to stand up in the crowd and start testifying and prophesying. And he basically tells him, hey, don't worry about it. He says, he actually says, don't worry about it because the battle's not yours, it's God's. And he says, tomorrow, march down against them. And, and he just says, go, go into battle against them. This is what Jehoshaphat does. In verse 18, he says, he bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. So they're like, hey, we're going to go to battle tomorrow. What are we going to do? They, they worship. <laughs> they went back to who God was. They worshiped. Then some of them stood up and they praised the Lord. But here's the thing. Early the next morning, they get up and leave. They didn't procrastinate. He didn't go, okay, we're going in a three, three to one battle. We're probably going to die today. Everybody go home, have a good night with your wife. Go make sure you get everything in order because tomorrow we die. That's not what he did. He said, hey, the battle of the law, we're going to worship tonight. We're going to get up early and we're going to go. But here's what he does. This is what I think is so crazy. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat, old fat Joe, appointed men to sing to the Lord. And to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. We actually just read that Psalm 29. I mean, uh, yeah, Proverbs, it's actually Psalm 29. For the splendor of his holiness. And they went out ahead of the army, singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. So real quick, just make sure we get the picture. The word he uses there is yada. Remember what we said about yada? This is yada. So what he did, Fat Joe's like, hey man, I have the, I have the perfect strategy how we're going to win this war. We're going to take all the singers, the musicians, you guys are going to go in the front. They're like, okay, right. sounds kind of great. You know, it's kind of, kind of nuts. Like, yeah, and you're not even going to have any instruments. Like, you're just going to go out there like this. And they're like, so surrender. Yeah, yeah, we're just, we're going to go out there worshiping. Like, you're going to be in the front. Right, so we're going to be the first people to, to meet. The, yeah, you're going to be the first ones. Sounds like a crazy strategy, but he's the king. Got to do what it says. But it literally says that's what happened. And they sing the same song. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. They're just walking, and they're walking down this valley. And they're just all going out there. I can only just picture in my mind this, this hundreds of thousands of men in Judah that are walking out there. And they're being led by their worship leaders. Like, like, I don't know how many worship leaders you met. We're not the toughest guys, okay? It's just not who we are. Uh, Tyler was. He was a ranger. And, and fortunate for him. But most of us, you know, it's not our thing. Like, we like to play instruments and sing. But these are the guys they put out. This is what happens. And what happens is the army follows suit. They're worshiping as well. They're yada as well. Which means their weapons are here. Their shields are here, and their hands are here. I don't know about you, but that is a crazy strategy to try to win a war. And I'll just give you a spoiler. Man, it's so great. You go read it. I want you to read it, because this is an incredible story. But what happens is, by the time they get to the other side, all three armies had turned on each other. The Lord had put them in confusion, and they killed each other. All of them, completely wiped out. To the point that we're now... They get over there and they're like, thanks to the Lord's love endures forever. I'll take this. I'll take that. Like it took them three days to go get everything from the army and bring it back. So here's what God did. He's like, hey man, when you're facing this, this, this battle that just seems like it's, it's, it's impossible. Here's what I want you to do. is stop trying to fight it. Just surrender to it. Surrender to me. And let me do the rest. Look, I don't know if he's going to give you three days worth of spoils. I don't know what he's All I know is his ways are way better than our ways. And I can tell you where I am today compared to where I was. I cannot imagine. Like, I could never even imagine that God would love me so much and use me in any way. And so what I'm going to ask you, stand up. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to go back into worship and move the chair if you need to. Oh my God.
Alright, so now we're gonna get the we're gonna get to practice what we preach. And the songs we sing at the beginning, we're gonna sing them again. We're gonna sing them again. We might sing something different. Here's the thing. If you like Kev, I can't sing, I don't wanna sing, fine. Pick pick one of those things in worship. Surrender to God. Thank him for the things that he's going to do. Shout unto the Lord. Sing to him a new song. Bow down before your king. Choose something to worship him this morning and let him move in your heart. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me.
us, God, right here in the middle of this little electric warehouse in Alabama, God. You would hear us. And, Father, that you would allow us to come into your presence this morning. God, not because of anything we've ever done or could do, God, because of you, because of the blood of your son, Jesus, we approach the throne boldly this morning. And so, God, I pray for every one of these men. I pray they understand how you see them, God. I mean, you love them so much, Father. You will never love them more. You can never love them less, Father. You love them right now. You want what's best for their life, God. You have a purpose for them and a plan. And God, these are these are world changers in this room. And I just pray, Father, that you would just let them see that. Father, as we worship you, I pray that our worship would not end right here this morning, that we would carry it out to every business place we're going, every place we're going, God, that there would be worship on our hearts at all times today, God. That we would seek you first. We would remember who you are. We would remember what you've done, God, but we would surrender ourselves to you today. So, God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you so much for who you are, for what you've done. I say this now. Everyone that agrees with me says, Amen. Amen. Amen.